I'm Andrew Graham Dixon, and I'm an art historian. I'm Giorgio Lucatelli, and I'm a chef. We are both passionate about my homeland, Italy. The smells, the colour, this is what food is all about for me. The rich flavours and classic dishes of this land are in my culinary DNA. And this country's rich layers of art and history have captivated me since childhood. It's meant to make you feel as if you are being whirled up to heaven. We're stepping off the tourist track and exploring Italy's northern regions of Emilia-Romagna, Lombardy and Piedmont. It's part of Italy that's often overlooked, but it drives the old country, and I want to show off its classic dishes. Not to mention its hidden legacy of artists, designers, intellectuals. One of the world's great buildings. <laughs> Bellissimo. This week, we are in Emilia-Romagna, the birthplace of modern Italian cuisine. And home to some of Italy's most fascinating artists and powerful dynasties. We are beginning our journey through this wonderful region in Bologna, its capital. I first came here with my parents when I was about 10 years old. And we must have visited just about every church in the city. And everywhere we went, we bought postcards of the altarpieces, the sculptures, the paintings. And I always remember going home and sitting at the kitchen table with my mum for about a week off and on. We made this scrapbook. Maybe it's my very first lesson in art history. I'm looking forward to see all these producers, to put some faces on, 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 on these people that I talked to through the telephone, you know, ordering stuff. Because, you know, our menu always has something that comes from this place. Since the Middle Ages, Bologna has been known by three nicknames. La Dotta, La Grassa e La Rossa. The Learned, the Fat and the Red. Renowned for its striking red building, militant politics, and rich cuisine, Bologna represents quality and taste, not to mention power. I love this statue. And you know, for me, this is really Bologna, this big breast, and they hold it there, <laughs> Neptune, the abundance. The abundance. Oh. It's a symbol of the fact that Bologna has always thought of itself as a rich That's city, right. a powerful city. You know, we can get Gian Bologna, the greatest sculptor of his age, to come here and create our Neptune fountain. And you can feel Bologna's sense of its own power as the capital of Emilia-Romagna here. Right. It's the architecture of power, the scale is enormous. It's not only in that, it's also like, you know, the culture, I mean, the culture of food is incredible. You know, Parmaham is, 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 is more recognisable than the Italian flag, isn't it? It's more, it's more representative of Italy than the Parmaham Italian Parmaham and Parmesan flag. cheese. Parmesan and, yeah. cheese. You know, all produced in a very traditional <coughs> artisanal way. Tradition is important in Bologna, a city which likes to remember its past. At its heart is the oldest university in the world, established in 1088, the home of La Dotta, the learned. Enrico Brizzi, one of my favorite Italian authors, studied here, and he's agreed to show us round. Wow. It's fantastic you just come in off the street like that. Yeah. The most influential uh, families, uh, the most uh, wealthy family in, all around Europe, send their children for a tour of the main universities and uh, it was uh, almost uh, compulsory to pass uh, from here. Have some time in Bologna. Are these their sort of graduation plaques? Yeah. The, the graduated students left here the coat of arms of their family. In 1562, Bologna began a massive remodeling of the city centre, including an expansion of the Cathedral of San Pietro. When the Pope realised with some alarm that the cathedral was destined to become bigger than St. Peter's in the Vatican itself, the money was diverted to these magnificent university buildings. 
and it gave birth to a new type of pilgrim to Bologna, students. You know, Andrew, what I think as well is that all the students come here and it's, it's not only important what they bring in and learn, but also what they take away. Of the colour of the building, but... Uh, These hallowed halls have seen the likes of Dante, Petrarch and Thomas a Becket pass through them. And there's one room which I'm particularly excited about seeing, a true example of how art can inspire learning. Yeah. Wow! This is one of the great things, not just of Bologna, this is one of the great things in the world. It's the only really authentic, surviving, early, early anatomy theatre, and that is a Renaissance coffered ceiling. And in the middle, we've got Apollo with his lyre pointing down, the god of medicine pointing straight down, right. probably to the hand of the anatomy teacher as he demonstrates to his students how to cut up a body. I feel a bit presumptuous doing this, but I think it's the only way to understand the space, which is a theatre of learning. He loves it up there. <laughs> yeah, because the professor in ancient times was also an actor. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Was performing absolutely. lessons. Absolutely. Teaching was a form of rhetoric, and you feel that up here. My come job on, would have been... Here. Hey, Georgia, come up here, Georgia, come on. My job would have been to be down here, I tell no, you, sweeping no. up the blood and the craves left over. <laughs> And so now you're on the spot, and you've got all the figures of the past. Gale and Hippocrates, they are all caught in a frozen moment of their teaching. And, and this canopy on the top of us is an allegorical figure of anatomy, but it's supported by these grisly figures of skinned men. Yes. So you can see the tendons. Yes, and the muscle and everything. This is incredible. He's even got a peeled penis. <laughs> You don't see many of those in world art. See that figure at the back? Uh -huh. Do you know what he's holding? No. He is holding a human nose, because that is Talia Cozzi, the founding father of cosmetic surgery, who apparently... He did. He did, he did the first nose job. So that's why he's holding that's a nose. the nose. Oh, my God. How many years ago? How no. many years ago? How, how many, many, how many, many noses, noses ago? ago? <laughs> Madonna. Enrico, I have to say thank you. It's just a masterpiece. It's not hard to see how Bologna earned its nickname, La Dotta, the learned. And walking through these stunning buildings, the sense of them as living places of learning really is striking. They give the whole city a sense of life and vivacity. But just like an army, students and their teachers march on their stomachs. And it's time to discover a true Bolognese meal. You know what, with all this culture and everything, I think that, you know, now we should just explore the second <laughs> bits. Enough dota, enough intelligentsia. Let's have to work out something about the grassa. <laughs> <laughs> we can't come to Bologna without eating the king of Italian dishes, pasta al ragù, a dish that's known worldwide by another name. Spaghetti Bolognese. In Italy, we are famous for our pasta, and Bologna is the place to come from fresh egg pasta, which artisans here have turned into a work of art. No wonder this city is known as the Grassa, the fat one. So, yeah, the same attention to detail, the respect to art and to music, you know, is paid to food. And so, here you are, look, this is all made by hand. Look at what he says there. The tagliatelle, le tagliamo su misura. They cut the tagliatelle how long you want it. So if you want heavy sauce, short tagliatelle. If you have a light sauce, like a pesto or a tomato sauce, then long tagliatelle. Two four or one four, they call them. No? So this is tailor-made pasta. That, no, but not no, only, look, he says in it, tortellini per ingannare i vostri mariti. To fool your husband. Because you take the moment, you tell your husband that you made it yourself. <laughs> per ingannare because, i mariti. Yeah. Buonasera, signora Edda. Buonasera. Oh, Era un che po'. piacere vederla. C'è un bel basino. Ma ciao, come stai? Bene. Mua. Mua. You don't come here just to buy stuff. It's not like a fuel station that you come in and you fill up the car and go. You talk to them, they talk to you. Look, there's a chair. You can sit down if you're tired. 
Food here is a living tradition. This shop has been in the same family for 130 years. Andiamo a fare un po' di pasta. Andiamo. 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 It's obviously very serious business, this pasta. Joe. It's very serious. This is the perfect place to get the tagliatelle for dinner tonight. This is like a cathedral. Prego. We enter in now the inner chamber. Prego, prego. When you eat spaghetti or when you eat dry pasta, the one who comes from the south, that's durum wheat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so durum wheat contains a lot of protein. These, because in the north, the type of soil, they just only grow soft wheat. So the soft wheat hasn't got any protein in it. So the al dente won't be there. The pasta would be very mushy. Okay, so by putting the eggs, which contains a lot of protein in the eggs, you're gonna achieve that al dente texture. This is like a, an incredible expression of how the, actually, the land determine what you have on the plates. You know, all the words, it's this spaghetti bolognese. Here, when they made the bolognese in Bologna, they don't know what spaghetti bolognese is. Nobody eats spaghetti bolognese. No bolognese, no bolognese. Noi solo facciamo... So how come the world over people eat spaghetti bolognese? Because the Americans, you know. Ah, okay. Vari passaggi. Have you seen this? This is called Mattarello. And signora, signora Eda, a cosa serve il Mattarello? A due cose, marito. no? Two things. To make the pasta, and when your husband comes back drunk, you wait behind the door <laughs> and boom, boom, boom. <laughs> And apparently they say that he, if you don't know why you hit him, he knows why you hit him. Mio marito lo conosce. Yeah, his husband knows this one very well, <laughs> Is Not that the right long. length for your That's um, perfect for our bolognese. E poi facciamo i nostri cestini, il famoso cestino. We cut them up and put them there. Questo è il nostro cestino. Non pomodoro, eh? She said don't use tomatoes. Pomodoro don't use tomatoes. Don't use tomatoes. Ah. Ecco qua. Buon appetito, eh? Don't drop it. <laughs> I'm leaving Andrew for a couple of hours to buy some other ingredients for dinner tonight. See you? Oh, yes. Three or four carrots. Wow. Grazie. Grazie a te. My ragu is based on a classic recipe written by Pellegrino Artusin in 1891. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. His book, Science in the Kitchen and the Art of Eating Well, is my Bible. In fact, here in Italy, is everybody Bible. Questo è un ragù all'antica. 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 Come quello dell'Artusi. Esatto. Fantastico. Senza il pomodoro, eh? Ma non lo so. Un pochettino? Eh, ci vuole. Eh? Sì, ce lo mettiamo? Eh, ce lo mettiamo. Un pochettino, una punta così. Una eh? punta? Una puntina. While Giorgio focuses on the local cuisine, I want to find a delicacy of my own, of the artistic type. I'm on the hunt for one of Bologna's hidden gems. Every major Italian town has a Pinacoteca Nazionale, National Art Gallery, which houses the work of local artists. Thankfully, there's 25 miles of porticos covering Bologna's pavements to keep the sun off my head. And with their frescoes, even these are artistic as well as functional. Hey, sono stanco. <laughs> I'm exhausted. Are you it's okay? It's too hot. Yeah, it's okay. But it's look at this. to find this place. Eh? It's not easy to find, but this is what I like. You know, here we are. It's an unassuming part of Bologna. Really unassuming. You, really unassuming. You wouldn't even know that this art gallery was here. It's just a little subtle sign, Ministero per i Beni e le Tecnità Culturali. But I found a real treat inside for you. This building may not be as impressive as the Uffizi in Florence, but inside there are real <laughs> treasures to be found. The pinnacle of Italian art is not restricted to Tuscany and Rome. Bologna and Emilia Romagna also produced some fantastically influential artists. The Bolognese do not like this idea that you simply paint what you see. 
Realism is not their thing. Art is about conveying an idea. It's a much more intellectual approach to painting. Guido Reni was born in Bologna in 1575 and became celebrated throughout Italy. But his fame dimmed as the Bolognese style of painting fell out of fashion. That I really like. This great painting was commissioned for Bologna's San Domenico Church. And you can just imagine the impact it would have had as you stared at it over mass. Certainly draws your eye. It's a drama. Yeah, it's a drama. It's yeah. the massacre of the innocents. So that's what they are, the little kids. This is one of the bloodiest scenes in all of the Bible. You know, a oh, genocide yes. enacted upon children. Yeah. And yet, the idea here in Bologna was that if you actually painted it as if it were real, it would just be so sensational that people wouldn't think about what's really going on. Whereas if you distance it all, people can bear to look at it and therefore they can think about it in a different way and be affected by it in a different way. For dinner, Andrew and I will enjoy a Bolognese masterpiece of a different sort, pasta ragù. It's a dish that sits firmly on the local tradition of rich Italian food. Must be one of the reasons Bologna is also nicknamed La Grassa, the fat. Bologna La Dotta would not exist without Bologna La Grassa. La Grassa, the fat one. For my ragù sauce, I'm following Pellegrino Artusi classic recipe. Artusi was obsessed by the idea of compiling comprehensive lists of recipes from every Italian region. Artusi, he's one of your heroes, right? This he's is... definitely my hero. He was the first writer that actually sort of put together in the book a concept of Italian cuisine. You know, because we have so many different regions with so many different microclimatic conditions and so many different ingredients. So obviously the diet is a little bit different. <laughs> so his belief is, was not just to give you a recipe. They did give you the whole history of the recipe and the meaning of the recipe. So it's kind of a, a culinary portrait of Italy. Garibaldi unified Italy politically, but he kind of unified Italy gastronomically. Do you know what I mean? I'm gonna have a little nice slap of butter. You said you were gonna put some heart in it. Was it a lamb butcher? Heart? Yeah, the butcher that we went this morning to get the thing. He says, oh, you want two hearts as well? I thought, yeah, I'll have the hearts as well. I thought it was really good to put some hearts in. So you must have liked Otello. If you've allowed Otello to alter the great Artusi's recipe, eh? Yeah, that's true, you're right. If you get some good advice in the market or it just seems right, I tell you, this you morning, follow it, yeah. So my meat is now kind of browning. I gotta put the vegetable in it that I already cooked. Day when I went to the, the butcher, hotel, he says it's true that Artusi say not to put the tomato, but just a nice little spoon of tomato per il colore, for the color. But you know what you're doing here. Artusi. You know what you're doing. You are, you are going to get hit on the head with that rolling pin. Because <laughs> she said, whatever you do, if you're making the ragu bolognese, you don't put the tomato in. But I really want to put a little bit of tomato in A tiny little bit. You're a heretic. <laughs> You're a heretic. I tell you what. I tell you what. Artusi has to say to you. Artusi had a very nosy priest, right, who lived near him, right, and he called him Don Pomodoro. Don Pomodoro. Do you know why? Because this priest got his nose into everyone's Everyone business. Everyone business. Every source. He's like the tomato. He gets in everywhere. In everywhere. Yeah. And look, I just put in literally, like a spoonful, maybe two. You should give some leftovers to her and see if she knows. Signora Eda, you mean? <laughs> Perfect. No. To the success of your heretical pasta sauce recipe. Mm. While my sauce is cooking, we got time to take in the sunset over Bologna. That's if we can make it up all the 280 stairs. I mean, what are you trying? It's all working up an appetite. That's what we're doing, working up an appetite for you. <sighs> Ci siamo. We arrive. Come. Oh, look at the moon! Andrew, look at the moon! 
It's so beautiful. Look, all the Centro Storico is just red, isn't it? Now we really landed in Bologna. To me, you know, the best dish is tagliatelle with ragù. It's the best dish ever. Can I take some cheese? Yeah. Un po' di parmigiano. Così? How much? As much as you like. I don't like too much. As much as you can afford, usually, they say. <laughs> Thank you, Artusi. Mm. Thank you, Edda. I think the pasta's delicious. Pasta is delicious. I mean, if that was spaghetti, Georgia, look. The, if that was spaghetti, spaghetti, all of yeah. that would fall off, right? That's exactly. But it's being caught right. in the knot. That's exactly. The spread of the idea of the spaghetti bolognese or with the meat sauce is very much attached to the immigrants. The immigrants left Italy because there was no enough food. So mm. when they went to America, you know, the only thing they the oh. only thing they say is because there was plenty full of meat there. So they put as much meat as you can with every dish of pasta in the head. So what had before been the dish you just eat once in a while when times are good and you've yeah. got some meat became suddenly it was something oh. that you know. Oh. Buongiorno. 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 Volevamo far la barba. There is nothing like a good shave and to freshen up in the morning. And I know that Andrew will love this place. But then, Giorgio, isn't this another example of how in Bologna, people who do everyday occupations somehow manage to do them in, in surroundings of such calm and dignity and beauty? You know, like the lady making the pasta, she's doing it in a in a shop that's like a palace. Beneath the calm and dignity is a volatile political history. It's not just the building that they are red in Bologna, the politics is too. The center of Bologna is full of small independent business. They all thrive because of socialist policies established by Bologna Communist Party in the post-war years. Small traders pay much lower business rate than large corporations. And is this link to the Communist Party than is in more recent times the reason for Bologna's third nickname, La Rossa, the Red. Your face will feel so good all day, you know. Grazie. Grazie. Arrivederci. 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 Bologna's reputation for political militancy is not limited to the post-war communist years. As far back as 1506, Bologna saw popular uprising against the ruling classes, which led to the city being annexed by the Papal State. The Bolognese spirit of rebellion rose again during the Second World War. Bologna was a center for the resistance. Over 1,800 resistance fighters were shot here by the Nazis. Bologna La Rossa has also left an artistic legacy. The 20th century Bolognese artist Giorgio Mirandi spent his career paying homage to humble, everyday objects, right up until his death in 1964. Day after day, he sat in this studio, rearranging and painting these pots. He's revered in Bologna, his studio is preserved as a shrine, and his life work is displayed in this new museum. It's a painting of uh, apparently almost nothing. There is this sort of like flavor of old Italy. It reminds me of, of like grandparents keeping things and never throwing away anything and, and giving a personality to each of the object that they mean something to them. You hardly ever get in Morandi anything that looks like luxury color. This is not luxury, this is simplicity. Yeah. If you think so about so it, then you have all those color in the front of you. It's like the ingredients, you get a lot of ingredients and most of the chefs just put them all in the dish. Like, you know, well, it takes a lot of strength and, and self-assertiveness to make sure that you only pick the right one and it will work for you. I think that's part of his cleverness as an artist. He's very much painting during the rise of global capitalism. Right. And if you wanted to find his sort of 
opposite in world art. It would be Andy Warhol, That's right. who's painting the ordinary objects of American life. But it's Heinz tomatoes. And it's brand, names. it's brand names, Brillo boxes. I mean, maybe that's, maybe that's Bologna La Rossa. Maybe, maybe yeah. this is a kind of counterblast because he's painting these pictures up until, well, he dies in 1964. Right. So maybe he's the sort of counterblast to Warhol. For me, Bologna definitely lives up to its three nicknames, La Dotta, La Grassa, and La Rossa. And they're all intricately intertwined, a fascinating marriage of food, culture, and politics. It's quite a comfortable, you know, very bourgeois town that you'd, you'd think uh, maybe had forgotten its socialist past, but it's still there, do you think? I think so. <laughs> So, it's goodbye to Bologna. Now, we're off to explore the rest of Emilia-Romagna. This is the Po Valley. This fertile land has nourished the region's rich history and fed the local culture, both literally and metaphorically. The beautiful river Po is the artery of Emilia-Romagna. It has painted the region in a palette of swirling fog, deep, dark soil and lush arable farmland. Many of the rich historical tradition of this region stem from these waters. This river is also the source of my best memory of Emilia-Romagna. They tamed the land to grow what they want, and here they even tamed the sea. And you know, and, and this is like something very special about it. I wanted to show Andrew one of the great pastimes of the Po Valley, with the land and the river as a backdrop. Umberto! The padellone is a traditional way of fishing, where friends can get together to share in the peace and tranquility of this land and get a meal too. Buonasera! These are your soci. Mie, mie amici, mie soci. Soci di merenda, compagni di merenda. What soci mean? Soci is because they all own this hat. Together, it's like going to the bar, isn't it? It's like, but it's a bit more secluded. It's more. It's like, calm. The, it's like the golf club, except with fish. golf <laughs> club. No, 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 the trick is done. Questa freccia, prova a spingere qui. Toccala. Press. Posso? Press. Non dalla press. Ah, okay. Press. Okay. Oh, yeah. it's coming up. Look at that. Look how big it is. <laughs> that is fabulous. Look at that. That's oh, look at the crab. Can you see the crab? Oh, that's what we're going to eat. Questi sono buoni. These are delicious, man. Attacchiamo i calzoni adesso. The name padellone refers to the shape of the net, which resemble the giant pan the fishermen fry their catch in. This baby red mallet, they're all different, you see? So you deep fry these that's little it. chaps? Just put a bit of flour and deep fry, that's it. It's not very difficult kind of fishing, I mean, I have to say. I think it's Italian people spending time together is about the drink and the food. The food always brings them together. For honest working men like Umberto and Banana, this pose from life is typical of Emilia-Romagna, rooted in the place. Semolino and a little bit of double zero flour, okay? So one stick to it, the other one's gonna make it really, really crispy. Now the only place they jump is in the pot. How long do they take to cook, Giorgio? What's very, very fast. We're gonna cook in about maybe one minute. Very and good, perché abbiamo fame. <laughs> Attenzione. See, Andrew, I really wanted you to come and see this, because this is really, when we're talking about richness of this land, and culture, and the real power of this land is really on these people and on this river that is brought down for thousands and thousands of years. This goodness from the Alps and it's brought it down to them. And they've been here every day taking a little bit with respect and with love 
And you know, look at the variety, the color, the beauty, and the abundance. This is what it's all about Emilia Romagna. Grazie. Sai cosa? Andrew, Andrew, per noi queste sono come le patatine, come le chips. This is like <laughs> fried like, chips. This is like fried chips. <laughs> fried chips. <laughs> Nel padellone, no stress. Sei libero. On the padellone there is no stress. So. Il bello del padellone è che qui sei libero, puoi pensare e fare quello che ti pare. It's the culture that you know is just, just a little step towards freedom, isn't it? Brindisi al padellone! Brindisi al padellone! Brindisi al padellone! Brindisi è getting more chaotic! After a strong coffee, we're back on the road and heading to the historical city of Ferrara. Definitely slightly the worst for wear. Uh, this brindisi was fantastic. Brindisi. Facciamo un brindisi. The city of Ferrara was built on the banks of the Po. It was the stronghold of the Este dynasty, who ruled here for over 300 years, until the end of the 16th century. Like many dynasties, the Este used arts and architecture to express their power and wealth. I wanted you to see this arch, Giorgio. That, that was designed by Alberti, the father of Renaissance architecture. Yeah. And on the top is a statue of Niccolò III d'Este. Scende la pioggia, ma che va, tutto vuoto intorno a te. I feel like I'm taking a reluctant eight-year-old on a tour around the architectural delights Six. of Ferrara. Yes. I'll have to find something better for you, eh? It's also nice oh, we'll to Today, Ferrara is a bustling university town, full of students and bicycles. The university was established by Alberto V of the Este in 1391. The Este invited artists, architects and scholars from all over Europe. Jewish bankers persecuted elsewhere were welcomed here. In fact, the doors were flung open to all who could contribute to making Ferrara powerful and successful. If you came from anywhere else in Italy and you arrived here, you'd be like stumbling out of the Dark Ages into this new Renaissance idea of what is a city. You know, these wide streets. This was really the first emphatic expression of a very particular Renaissance idea, which was a planned town. You know, town planning. Mm -hmm. The medieval town just grows like an organism and you end up with this yes. labyrinth where yeah. poor lives next to rich. Everything's a kind of chaos. Here in Ferrara, for the first time, the Este said, no, we're not going to have that kind of city anymore. We're going to have a planned city, wide streets, but only for the rich. <laughs> and it's just lined with palaces in all directions, and at the centre of it all, this thumping great expression of Este power, the Palazzo di Dimanti, yeah. with these amazing kind of sharp diamonds of stone all over it, studded like a yeah. kind of piece of chain mail. I mean, there's nothing else like it in Renaissance architecture, right. not quite like this. It's, it looks very modern, isn't it? Somehow? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, you know, fascist architects looked at this building when they were designing, you know, in the 30s and the 40s. Right. They were looking at this kind of symmetry, this architecture of power. I think it's very beautiful, mm. but I also think there's something slightly sinister about it. It's telling you, you know, if you're one of the Ferrari's poor, don't mess with us or we'll come down on you like a... Just the fist is yeah, squishy. Yeah, absolutely. In their heyday, the Este were as dominant as the Medici and even married into other powerful dynasties, including a notorious union with Lucrezia Borgia. But in 1598, with no heir to continue the line, Ferrara was claimed by the Papal States. Today, the Este dynasty is largely forgotten. Because the Este lost the power battle, all of their buildings got stripped of their possessions, got taken to other places. So what we're left with is this beautiful, fantastic, but rather melancholy stage set. It's like the set of a play, but all the actors are gone.
We are driving further west along the Po Valley to Modena. This city is home to two of my favorite things, balsamic vinegar and fast cars. But it's also home to a truly heart-stopping work of art, one that's rooted in the soil and the blood of this region. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to give you a role in the story as well. If you don't a role in the story. Yeah. Are you... So you have to imagine that it's 1480. You've done something terrible. Maybe you've tried to poison the Duke of the Este dynasty, but you've been caught and you've been sentenced to death. Now, they're taking you down this street. Right. When you get to the end of the street, they're going to rip pieces of your flesh off with red-hot pincers. They're going to hang you by the neck until you're dead. Wow. But you've got some friends with you. Wow. And they are the members of the local confraternity of the good death. And it's their job to make sure that you repent before you die. This is their church. They stop you here. Okay. And they bring you in because they want you to see one last thing. Before I die. Before you die. I would like to have a risotto before I die. You, maybe you had your last wish already, so assume ah, okay. you've had your risotto. This object is going to be the last thing, really, that you should hold in your mind's eye if you want to save your soul. It was created in 1477 by an artist called Guido Mazzoni. What is he made of? It's made of terracotta. No. Yeah. It's made of the same earth of Emilia Romagna from which, from which all the things that we've been eating grow. So the idea behind the sculpture is that you are going to your death and I, as a member of the company of the good death, want you to have as good a death as possible. And that if you look at Christ's dead figure lying while Mary the Madonna grieves over him while Mary Magdalene twists her face into this scream of anguish. Somehow this emotion will transmit from that sculpture into you and that you will feel these things in your heart and you will be moved to turn to the priest who accompanies you on the scaffold. You will confess and maybe, just maybe, this sculpture may help to save your soul. has achieved what is set out for, doesn't it? These sculptures are refined and sophisticated, yet unashamedly proud of their roots, having grown out of the humblest of materials, the Emilia Romagna clay itself. Andiamo. Andiamo. Well, you can step out of character now. What draws me most to this region is the beautiful produce that grows out of this soil. For 25 years, I've been buying balsamic vinegar traditionale from the Agazzotti family. But until now, I never met my supplier, Ettore Agazzotti. Ci si incontra! Ben arrivati! Piacere, sono Andrea. Andrea, mio amico. <laughs> This is the place where it all happens. The produce transforms itself and becomes balsamic vinegar traditionale. The real deal. The real deal. The Agazzotti family has been making vinegar since 1714. The family has perfected the art of creating a symphony of flavor out of the most modest of ingredients. Grapes, patience and a colony of bacteria that the vinegar producer called the mother. La madre è le sono in pratica le colonie di acetobatteri. The mother is a colony of bacteria. Si riformano continuamente. They keep on reforming itself. Right. So what does the mother do to this liquid? I mean, the natural sugar then that is inside the mother transformed the bacteria sugar into that vinegar. Sort of eating that's right. That's wow. right. So the mother bacteria colony that you still use in every batch every of years, was, right? actually, was actually first sort of created, and you're still it's still the same bacteria family this, that's doing the, it. Exactly. So and it's not, this is the same, this is, the same family. That's exactly what the value would be. 
The value of the acetaya is on the value of the matter. If you start tomorrow, you're going to have to wait quite a long time before the right. But some vinegar is often swept aside as a simple condiment that you use to dip your bread in or throw over a salad. But balsame vinegar traditionale is a very different to normal balsame vinegar. And that's why this tiny little yeah, bottle yeah. of 25 yeah. years old vinegar costs 250 uh, euros. The aging oh, factor, I think, is yeah, a typical want. expression of this land. This patient, wonderful. this idea of, you know, I can't wait to have something fantastic. It's wonderful, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. I dream of you, chips, chips. Mm. That is fantastic. The sweet with the salt, it's even more intense. It takes 25 years to get the balsamic out of that barrel, doesn't it? After 25 years, we actually managed to meet each other. Well, here's to both of you. <laughs> Ettore, Giorgio. Salute. Salute. <laughs> Brindiamo. This trip to Modena is a dream for me. First I get to meet Ettore, and now I get to satisfy my second love, Pascal. Modena is home to Enzo Ferrari. And we can't come here without going to visit the new Ferrari Museum, a testament to his life work. He was obsessed with racing since childhood, and he turned his dream into a quest to build the ultimate racing machine. Today, Ferrari is famous worldwide. Enzo's original workshop and office, founded here in 1929, is still standing, sheltered by this spectacular museum designed by architect Jan Kaplitsky. It's a perfect demonstration of how tradition meets modernity and technology in this region. It's all white, it's like an art gallery, the cars are on plinths. So beautiful, aren't they? I think cars deserve to be looked at in terms of, you know... Especially these that, kind that of cars. sculptural form, look at that beautiful shape. And an well, airplane on it's it's funny, look, you were looking at these cars as if they're sculptures, but they do actually look like sculpture of the 1940s. If you think of Henry Moore, if you think of art, yes. you've got a sort of biomorphic, that was in the air. Mm -hmm. So even the cars are like that. <laughs> even if you're that ugly, you look good thing. on this one. <laughs> Ferrari seems to me to be the man who almost like literally gives Italy the engine to drive into the future. Emilia Romagna has also given the world Ducati, Maserati, Lamborghini, what a roll call for one fairly small region. This real modern aesthetic and this culture of design, mm. why do you think it flourished in northern Italy? I think it's the passion and the drive. You know, they, they want to show everybody that they could do something really great. They dream about being. That's what Ferrari used to say, I dream about being Ferrari. I dreamt to be. Ferrari, and I become Ferrari, you know, I dreamt it, Just, you know, can yeah. you imagine how strong you must have been feeling to dream about it? No more about Medici, no, no more. more Medici, no more Este, no more that. They took the mantle on, and they took it on through showing something that they could do. So they, they went forward words with that. It's so important. But these cars weren't just made to be looked at, they were designed to be driven. Every aspect of these cars is a product of craftsmanship. Even today, every engine is signed by the mechanic who puts it together. I'm crying, it was so good. Oh, that was so good. <laughs> you enjoyed it? Oh yeah, George, I enjoyed it. <laughs> I feel my blood is going round. Finally, we arrive in Parma, our last stop in Emilia-Romagna. This town is famous for the highest quality delicacy, Parma ham, Parmesan cheese. And quality control has become a business too. The EU has based its food standard agency in this tiny town. Baptistry, Archbishop's Palace, Cathedral. Beautiful Romanesque Cathedral. It's not just the food that's world class. Church after you. One of the world's great buildings. And how cool is it? It's like instant air conditioning. You come out 40 degrees heat and here you can relax, you can enjoy, you can see. Here in Palmer's Cathedral, there's one of the most innovative, awe-inspiring works of art of the whole Renaissance. 
It's in the 1520s. Mm. Antonio Allegri, Death Will Correggio, was commissioned to paint the dome of the cathedral. Right, now you, now you look up to the dome. And it's showing us the assumption of the Virgin Mary. She's being whooshed into heaven after her death. And she's going to meet her son, Jesus Christ, in heaven. It's so uplifting, isn't it? It just like goes like like a spiral. Unbelievable. It's a painting that's meant to make you feel as if you are being whirled up to heaven. It does. It does. It really feels like it's lifting you up. Levitation. But what's amazing about this is that it's 10 years after Michelangelo's finished the Sistine Chapel. And the people in Parma think, ah, oh, we're not going to be outdone by those Romans. So what they do, this is not a ceiling. This is not a ceiling. This is a dome. In the past, if they painted a dome, they just painted it blue with gold stars. Heaven. Correggio set himself the challenge to paint the Madonna entering heaven. Was he really appreciated for this? Did well, these people love it. See, this is the terrible paradox. Titian, supposedly the greatest painter in the history of painting, right. he heard about this and he looked at it and said, this is incredible. You couldn't pay Correggio enough for this. In fact, if you turned that dome upside down and made it into a bowl and filled it with gold, it wouldn't be enough money. But the tragedy of it is that the patron, the canon of the cathedral, who was obviously a very conservative man, he simply said, it looks like a stew of frog's legs. <laughs> <laughs> that was his judgment. No and, and, and Correggio finished it in 1530. It took him eight years from start to end. He never got another commission in Parma. No. So it was like, thank you very much, but no thank you. No way. It's <laughs> bellissimo. Grazie. <laughs> Diamo. Eh? Prego, prego. Just a little way out of Parma is my great friend Massimo Spigaroli's farm. Parma is famous for his dried ham, and I think Massimo Sculatello di Zibello is definitely some of the best in the world. Sculatello is a type of Parma ham only made with the finest cut of pork rump. So Massimo, what do we use? It's very, very simply. Salt, pepper. Salt and pepper. Uh, garlic. Garlic. Red wine for Tana, territorio. The bladder. Pig's bladder. Pig bladder. A meat pig. Meat from the pig, which is a rump. is the okay. culatello. 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 What makes this recipe is the fog, is the silent. <laughs> These are the ingredients as well of this pig. Isn't El it? tempo, el time. El time. Time is what plays. It's like for time, the balsamic time. vinegar, again, the master of time. The master of time when they make Ferraris, the master of time when they make Colatello. They know how to wait for something that gets better and better and better. The meat is massaged with garlic and wine, then is covered with salt. Finally, it's wrapped tightly in a pig's bladder. It's a technique that hasn't changed for centuries. That's the same way that his grandfather used to make culatello for Giuseppe Verdi. What? Giuseppe Verdi, you know, they used to buy culatello from his grandfather. Look, this is where they actually, the artisan is king, you know. Fantastic. How long will it be hanging? It wow. can stay up to two, three years without any problem. When it's ready, it's down to the cellar. Mm. I can smell it. <laughs> The march of the pig leads here. This is the paradise of the pig. This cellar has been used to cure culatello for nearly 700 years. They're like sleeping bats. Look at that. Massimo, this is bellissimo. This is the paradise of the maiale, eh? Pig paradise. Have you seen, look, Giorgio. Are these the names of the clients? Chi è Principe Carlo? That's Prince Charles's one. Look at that, Prince Albert of Monaco. Armani! Armani. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
This cellar is like a perfectly honed machine. To work best, Massimo must keep exactly 5,000 culatello hanging in here. He decides every day how much to open or close the window, depending on the temperature, depending on the humidity. So the fresh air will come in with the fog, the humidity, and these activate the noble white mold then give that characteristic flavor to the cured meat. This is the last ingredient coming naturally through the wind. And the men decide how much to expose the culatello to. Aspettiamo un attimo, entra il profumo. Senti quanto profuma la storia, eh? Wow, that's a perfume of history Posso and io. everything. <laughs> smell that. Qui senti il profumo, il dolce. Mm. If a woman smells like that, would be my lover. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Allora questo lo prendi così poi lo assaggi. Eh. Lo mangiate a Londra. <laughs> no, oh. we're going to eat it before we get back to London. I'm oh. letting you away with that. <laughs> How wonderful that something as simple as fog or even silence can generate such incredible flavor. I've been struck for the first time on this trip that the features of the landscape are actually just as important to the art of the region. The fog that swirls through Correggio's fresco in Parma Cathedral, just as it swirls around Massimo's cellar. Centuries old tradition are vital to this region livelihood, even today. So preserving them is important to everyone who lives here. Palma's Palatine Library contains a rare historical treasure that I'm desperate to get a peek at. Wow. That is what I call a library. Fantastic. This book is one of the earliest existing Italian recipe books, written in 1680 by Carlo Nascia, who was private chef to the Duke Ranuccio Farnense. This 400 years old manuscript has recently been restored. This book is uh, very important. It really tells you what the cookery of that time was like. Obviously, this is not the cookery of the poor people. This is cooking of the rich. The recipe are very simply written, but is a, a very intelligent book because he has reference to French food, he has reference to Far East food. So it shows you how sophisticated they were on their taste, you just even see, that long time I'm ago. Just, some of these recipes have just caught my eye. Like, what's don't that? touch it first. Ah, you've been to Oxford, you should know that you don't touch a manuscript. I touch it because I got the gloves. So get your hands off for one time. Can I look intelligent that you look like a peasant? For one time. Yeah, please, you know? Go for it, George. I got the gloves. <laughs> Pasticcio try, di lombo, pasticcio di carne, <laughs> le torte diverse. The Farnese dukes of the 17th century would use these astounding banquets as political tools demonstrating their power and wealth to visiting dignitaries who'd be left in awe and wonder. This is amazing, and the smell of this book, it smells of a kitchen, smell it. For chefs like Carlo Nascia and Pellegrino Artusi, food is not just something to fill up your belly. It smells <laughs> of a kitchen. It also can fed the mind and be used to great intellectual ends. This is what modern cookery is all about, and, and this is how we start to learn, is when people like that start to write these books. This book has been restored by a group of very special ladies who call themselves the Fornello Dining Club. <laughs> they want to ensure that these recipes are kept alive, and most importantly, enjoyed. For our last meal in Emilia-Romagna, they have invited us to try out one of Nasha's recipes. I'm going to cook something for you, which is this really special dish that is the rosa di Parma. Si. Very simple ingredients. It's a fillet steak. Filetto. Il filetto. Aperto. Open up, butterfly open. Then we've got some garlic, some rosemary, some parma ham, some parmesan, and again... Lambrusco. Lambrusco. <laughs> non ancora. Vi rincontrate tra di voi. 
Sì. E chi fa da mangiare? Tutte, 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 tutte insieme. Sì, sì, sì. E poi vi sedete a mangiare. Sì, certo. Bellissimo. Without the effort of these women, this recipe and many others would have been lost forever. È stata un'idea di tutto perché volevamo sì. restaurare questo volume che è veramente un volume molto importante. importante. Sì. Very important ridotto, concept. Ho ridotto male, molto tenuto, Was... tenuto male in brutte condizioni. Perché noi l'abbiamo trovato in condizioni eccellenti. <laughs> the fillet is stuffed with parmesan cheese and parma ham. Then rolled and tied. Quanto? Allora, questo è il boccone dello chef. Yeah, I love the way that the cheese mixes in with the parma ham and you get the sweet flavor and then the wine kicks in. That's right. With the cream, I mean, this is rich food. This book proved that the banqueting was something that was not just about food, was about showing your power, your understanding of who was sitting around the table, what they were going to eat and show them your understanding of the world that surround you, to get things from Genova, to get things from Venice, si, si, to get si, things si, from si, Sicily. Si, si. That was a show of power. Cheers, everybody. Un brie, un brie, un brie. These ladies might be just a bit more glamorous than our friends at the fishing hut, but the sentiment's the same. Grazie, grazie. To keep the heritage and traditions of this region alive. Emilia Romagna is where centuries old traditions have met with the modern world. Oh. The people here know how to appreciate the silence with the speed, richness with simplicity, and always with an eye to enjoying life. One of the things I was struck by, particularly in Bologna, which was for me a great rediscovery, was the extent to which people doing relatively modest occupations, like making pasta or you know, being a barber, managed to carve out for themselves this fantastic environment to work in. They've kept that tradition of the small... The respect of the working person. Yes, well. that it doesn't have to be a multinational company. You can stay small and it'll still work. What do you think your abiding memories will be of this trip through Emilia-Romagna? Oh, it's, for me, it was just incredible to see these people and they got this such a joy of life in one side almost like the southerner, you know. And then, in the other side, you have this absolutely w tough work ethic. They can wait for their produce. You mean sort of the joy of the south and the work ethic of the north? That's right. Fused. Well, this theme of patience or, you know, taking a long time to get something just right, I think it's true of the art as well. Do you remember that? That amazing dome painted by Correggio. Oh, my favorite thing. That was my favorite thing ever. I've never seen anything like that. That's much better than the Sixteen Chapel. <laughs> you think that, that's think much so. better than the Sixteen Chapel? Much better. Spoken like a true Northern Italian. <laughs> so where are we going to go next? I'm going to take you to Lombardy. I'm going to take you to my region. My view of the world started from there. I want you to have a look at it from it as well. So Giorgio's going home. And the ammo. And the ammo. Push down on the accelerator. Captivated by the light and colour of the Côte d'Azur, Richard E. Grant reveals the Riviera, a history in pictures. Tomorrow night at 8 here on BBC HD. Tonight, we're off to QI next. <laughs>